This is the podcast that puts you at the pointy end of the airplane with two veteran airline captains. We'll offer insight into the pilot brain. We'll have some fun and promise not to get too techy. Each weekly episode has a segment that provides inside information on what's really going on behind the cockpit door. And we'll discuss some industry current topics that might affect your travels. Your two pilots and co-hosts are Les Abend and Mike Strauss. Les has over four decades and over 25,000 hours of experience flying airplanes. The Boeing 727, 757, 767, and the 777 were all part of Les's repertoire before he retired. He was also a Czech airman. Additionally, Les still has the good fortune to be a 21-year contributing editor for Flying Magazine. He's been an on-air analyst and op-ed contributor for CNN, in addition to MSNBC and NBC, among others. And finally, Les is the author of Paper Wings, a mystery suspense whodunit thriller. Mike is a current A320 captain and Czech airman for a major airline with over 17,000 hours of flight time. In addition to his airline experience, Mike has a diverse general aviation background as an airplane salesman and a corporate pilot flying celebrities and VIPs. If you haven't done so already, please listen to the Welcome Aboard introductory episode. Don't get on an airplane until you've listened to Candid Cockpit. Hey everybody, welcome to this week's episode of Candid Cockpit. My name is Les Aubin. And I'm Mike Strauss. Got that out of the way. (laughs) (laughs) Um, On this week's takeoff episode, we're going to be discussing what may possibly be a trend in the commercial aviation industry uh, that's being discussed on the news. Is it a trend? We'll, 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 We'll get into that, but... Um, there were two prominent accidents, two significant accidents that occurred. One uh, was in, in, in JFK on January 13th, where there was a what we call a runway incursion between um, a 777 that was crossing a runway and a Delta 737 that was doing a takeoff. And then uh, in Austin, we had another incident, not quite the same type of event, but a close call uh, on February 4th where there was a FedEx airplane landing at the same time there was a Southwest airplane given a clearance to take off. Right. In low visibility conditions, I might add. In low visibility conditions. Good point. Uh, And then, of course, uh, there was on February 27th at Boston's Logan Airport. That was a pretty close one as well. There was a uh, a landing um, that was occurring between a... um, JetBlue airplane, a, a, a E-190 to be specific, and a uh, departure on a crossing runway for a Learjet 60. S- correct. Corporate, yeah. pilot, corporate cor- jet. Corporate jet, yeah. exactly. So is there a trend? We'll talk about it. And uh, for the cruise segment, we're going to discuss the love-hate, and I'm going to have to really dig deep for that love part, yeah. uh, hate relationship of cruise scheduling, um, who really keeps us where we're supposed to be and where we're where where we're at and that's the biggest part you know that southwest meltdown they didn't know everybody was right so that caused a that caused wreaks havoc you know crew scheduling is um they pretty much control our life once we get into a situation that uh things need to be changed you right know, up, up until that point you don't even have to talk to them right but we very often refer to crew schedule so what's it all about what is right. it there for yeah. uh and then finally for the landing segment we'll talk to you we'll, we'll put you inside what's going on when uh pilots are talking to air traffic control from and we're just going to do it uh f- from uh um time just prior to engine start to the takeoff clearance right and we'll give you some insight on on how that all works yeah we brief we briefly touched on it on an early segment about in about training right and communication being one of the more difficult parts of flight training so this this would be good insight very good yeah. And uh, hey, everybody, before we get started, uh, this is something we ask all the time, real simple. Uh, we would appreciate very much if you would invite your friends, invite your family to uh, to listen to the podcast um, and send us an email. If you've got a topic that you'd like us to consider, send that email to podcast at candidcockpit.com. Um, and please uh, watch us on, uh, on YouTube. And uh, you can also follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. And I think people are listening to this because we're getting a lot more uh, email questions for yeah, topics and stuff like that. We absolutely so. are. Hey, 
Hey, everybody. Welcome to our uh, takeoff segment of our episode. Uh, initially, we discussed uh, in the intro uh, that um, these events are becoming um, a trend, and we're talking about these runway incursion, uh, near-miss type events. Right. And, and uh, so the first one, briefly, uh, as mentioned, it was on January 13th. It was between an American Airlines uh, 777 that crossed the runway Theoretically, when it should not have, um, while a Delta 737 was taking off on the uh, on, on an intersecting runway, right, right. Um, it was a taxi versus a takeoff situation. It got pretty close. And it, it did within a thousand feet. Within a thousand feet. And yeah. uh, controller and Delta pilot both did a phenomenal job in getting everything halted. They did, and the more research I looked into it, the uh, the, the automatic system which which announces that there may be a possible intrusion mm-hmm. um, uh, that did get that did activated. Right. And it got the controllers going pretty quick. Right, that, right. That's for sure. So that was one. The next one was on February fourth, um, and that was in Austin. Uh, there was a Southwest airplane that was cleared at the at the same time that a FedEx airplane, in what you mentioned in the intro, was um, was low visibility conditions. Mm-hmm. That's that's the uh, FedEx airplane was um, given a clearance to land at the same time the Southwest airplane was given a clearance to take off. Which in itself is not uncommon. Right. You know, you an aircraft is cleared to take off and there's a, an aircraft on a four or five mile final. And some airports, it's even a little tighter. You know, New York sometimes can be a little tighter, especially at LaGuardia. Uh, Boston, in fact, is another one. We'll talk about that in a second. But, you know, so everything was, I think, going the right way. But... You know, what happened to the Southwest guy? Was he too slow to take off? Was the controller a little late in giving the takeoff clearance? You know, was South was FedEx going a little bit faster than it should have at that point in its its approach? You know, so there's a lot of questions that need to be answered. But. Well, I think, uh, I mean, obviously in low visibility conditions, the priority is the approach. Um, so I, I had a, I have a feeling that it, that it might have been that Southwest airplane um, was not given a takeoff clearance quick enough. Right. But, you know, I'm speculating on that one. But the bottom line is it got close enough that it could have been a, a problem. However, in a, the alert FedEx pilot uh, and actually the controller said go around. Um, they went around and they performed a procedure that we practice all the time and it didn't become an issue. Didn't And didn't the controller, did the t- controller tell us how to tell, tell the, I'm um, sorry, the FedEx jet to go around or did he tell the Southwest to abort its takeoff, but yet Southwest had already continued did, continued the takeoff. You know what? I got to be honest with you. I don't know the complete facts on that, but yeah. what we're touching on is the, is is the idea is that you know are these events a trend that's occurring and and why are they occurring? Right. So um, the bottom line is everybody did their job and nobody got hurt. Just off topic. Sometimes if you say to me squirrel, it's because you know there's a squirrel outside. Right. Okay. So just so you know, there, is a, not, there really outside. is a squirrel outside. It's our studio. There's no squirrels in our studio. <laughs> Sorry, I get accused of this okay. often. But, yes. but yeah, is it a trend? Well, you know, define a trend. Now we move on to the next right. event, right? which is in Boston, included an airline I'm fairly familiar with and an airport I'm fairly familiar with. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and the intersections are very close. So it was a, it was a, um, uh, a JetBlue airplane that was an Embraer 190 that was landing. Um, on what uh, is called runway four right, which is four left. Uh, I believe it was. Oh, it was four right. You're right. You're right. Yeah, yeah, it was four. It was right. four right. Yep. And then the um, the the uh, there was a corporate airplane, a Learjet uh, sixty model. Correct. Was which which is a fairly uh, a large Learjet. It is um, sophisticated aircraft. Very right? sophisticated yeah. airplane. Not that that makes a difference, but anyhow, they were on the intersection runway of runway nine. And what happened was um, they got pretty close, and they, the JetBlue airplane did exactly what it's supposed to be, and they were they were given the clearance to go around because I did listen to those right. tapes. Um, however, I'm sure that they had the power up by the time they were given that clearance, but it got it got close. Yeah, it did. It got yeah. close, and unfortunately, that comes down to the Learjet did not have a takeoff clearance, and that's something that's going to be investigated. Right? Yeah. yeah. At least so, that's the that's the initial. Yeah. Um, Reaction and it was, it was given what's called a lineup and wait. And this runway uh, configuration at Boston, when the winds are let's say out of the east, northeast, sometimes even just due north, it's pretty prevailing. Yeah, yeah, you'll end up landing on one runway, and they'll have an aircraft lined up on runway nine, waiting for the landing aircraft to clear that runway, go past that runway, and then they'll launch the aircraft off of runway nine. And then the next guy will land and they'll do the exact same sequence. And it's very, very common for that airport. A little like Kennedy and 3-1 left from an intersection and 
two two and anyway. Going yeah, to- but but the bottom line is it's it's about efficiency. It's about efficiency. Yeah, and if you you know efficiency for fuel, efficiency for time. So um, you know, and that all has to be choreographed very well. The the controllers have their criteria when they can allow an airplane to take off while there's one landing. So um, once again. That's all being investigated by the NTSB as a potential runway incursion or, or a close call, near miss, however you want to define it. Um, so where, where we're going with this is, um, is this a trend? I was asked this on a uh, on a, a, a news program um, whether this is something that is 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 starting to happen, and and uh, we saw today. Um, uh, on a newscast uh, by uh, network MSNBC that, you know, perhaps this is the, what we call the canary in the coal mine, I believe. Uh, Sully used that. Uh, yeah, Sully used that uh, terminology. And it's possible because of the, um, you know, th- these things seem to be coming to light um, more than usual. Right. I, I remember in the 90s, um, we had some uh, loss of control incidents with 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 uh, commercial airplanes, yeah. and there were some significant ones. And we did sort of a what you would call, um, you know, a safety summit, and all the airlines regrouped, and we re- began training with these instances of loss of control. Right. Guess what? We don't have those anymore. Not anymore, right? Yeah. You know, and it, it unfortunately it takes events to create those summits and get new rules or regulations or new training in place. The objective is not to hurt people. Right. And that's what's, I if, guess if there's a silver lining to the events that are, are being in the news now is there have been no injuries uh, through these events. Right. Uh, there's some other events, some turbulence events that have created some injuries and one death. But they're, um, so I think that it's getting addressed a little sooner in the in the process to yeah. prevent the injuries, prevent the accidents, so it still remains just an incursion or an incident without injury or, or loss of life. Absolutely. Yeah. So um, you know, I, I applaud uh, Billy Nolan, the uh, the acting FAA administrator, for uh, doing an emergency summit. That's going to happen uh, next week, which will be uh, the week where uh, we recorded this this broadcast on March seventh. So I, I believe it's uh, next week on Wednesday. I could be wrong, but anyhow, they're doing this summit with all the industry players. They're doing it with the airlines. They're doing it with. Um, uh, controllers they're doing with the unions, right? Uh, and they're going to, and it's not just the executives at the airline. It's going to be pilots from the airline. It's going to be union, you know, union leaders. It's going to be the airline industry, airline, airline executives. It's going to be ATC. I'm sure it's going to be controllers and management in ATC as well. And I applaud them because I, I think that um, you know, there, the, each one of these circumstances has. Um, a, a different aspect to it, but you know, if it is a trend, let's let's grab it now and find out what the heck's going on. Find that common thread between all these yeah. incidents, and that's the thread that needs to yeah. be fixed. And it might not be; it might just be a spe- you know, it might be individual events, like for instance, the Hawaii, the the Maui event, um, where the airplane uh, was climbing, then all of a sudden took a major dive toward right, the right. ocean. Um, that's unrelated to runway incursions, it but is. does that highlight? Something, something else, new, something else on. that's that that we should be taking right. uh, a look at. Yeah, and you know, and it's it's kind of you know we 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 say that once the media gets a hold of let's say one incident, it's it they can build on that to other incidents. You know, I mean, there's just like uh, driving down the road. There's always accidents. There's always incidents. We don't hear about them in aviation. We can go months with nothing, and then 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 have you know several stories in a row because you. One story begets the next and the next and the next. Right. And but it's, I think it's also good because the media is bringing this to the world's attention and therefore it must be addressed. So the executives and the powers to be are are jumping on this a little bit sooner than maybe they might in, in and, the past. And you bring that. And I, I don't mean to be critical of the media because occasionally I participate in right. it, you know. But, uh, you know, at the end of the day, it, it, you, when you start to you start to get sensitized to a lot of these incidents, because uh, MSNBC once again had something on air uh, with with a passenger that went a little little crazy and potentially right. uh, could have seriously injured a flight attendant. Now, that passenger had mental illness problems, we're finding out. Right. But, you know, what's going on? And um, is there is there something that we should examine in all yeah, of Yeah, and that's what hopefully the summit will will, will reveal. What yeah. is it that needs to be examined? Or what, it'll be a several things. 
to, to examine. You know, going to the passenger issue, I mean, that takes you back to 9-11 a bit because of the media and what the investigators were able to learn about, let's say, Flight 93. People are not afraid to get involved. Right. You know, I think right. that's that's brought that to the forefront. If if passengers see an airplane that have that passengers are on an airplane that see this type of incident, they're going to get involved. Or before they might have just sat back and and done nothing. And but, I've had that type of experience on an aircraft with a passenger. Yeah. You know, and we got passengers that got Me involved. Too. Yeah. You know, so I think there's I think all of this is very positive in an effort to keep aviation safe. I mean, when was the last fatal accident in the U.S. with a U.S. airline? 2009. Right, right. Well, let's, let's, uh, let's knock on wood for we that We don't one. have that again, yeah. yeah. yeah Agreed. Yeah, absolutely. But again, the training, you know, and there's new people coming in, you know, newer, younger air traffic controllers, newer, younger pilots coming in. I think the training does a phenomenal job in getting them ready to do their job. And now it's time to gain that experience. And by addressing these issues now, they'll help those pilots gain the experience that they'll need when they become a captain or as they move up the ATC ladder. And let's and and good points. And and let's not forget about the air traffic controllers. Now I did some research, and and the FAA, um, you, you know, is is um, filling their slots. Of the, I, I didn't get the impression, or at least the FAA is putting out a statement, that they don't have a shortage, right. li- like we've been talking about, a shortage of experience level for pilots. So, um, you know, some of these uh, incidents that we were just talking about may involve, you know, a controller a controller right. error. Of you course. Know, we're all human. Right. Um, so, uh, you know, it, does this relate to uh, the need to hire more controllers, more experienced controllers? But they go through a pretty serious... Um, long it's several months, several well, it, it goes to several years sometimes to to qualify at a particular uh, facility as right. well. Right. Well, even even in just a particular spot in the facility, you know, a ground controller, right. you could, you know, you come out of the the uh, the academy after I want to say it's eight or nine months. Um, then you go to a facility, and then before you're cut loose, so to speak, in that one position, there's several more months of training right. in that one I th- position. I think the initial part of the training is three to four months, and, and then some of it is dependent upon, you know, we've got folks uh, locally to us where we're recording in, in Embry-Riddle that actually train to be air traffic controllers. Right, right. right? Yeah, and I guess it's true. The, the whole training, because if you're going to come out and go to, let's say, a tower might not be as difficult as a, a, right. a, a, a center facility or route traffic control center, you know, so yeah, there's, there's, there's different levels of training, but they take people that, and getting air traffic control experience is difficult to do unless you're an air traffic controller. Right. So I think that's why the training is so good. And they do, they come out. I know several air traffic controllers. I was in the program. I was not the program, but I was hired. Rephrase that. I was interviewed, took the test, told I would get a job. I was put in the pool and then I was kicked out of the pool because of an age issue. Um, they want, you have to retire as an air traffic controller at 56, which is nine years younger than pilots do. Right. So again, their focus on safety and sharpness is, is right. quite and quite high. 30 is the max age that they want to take. Yeah, you turn okay. 31 and you're out because right. they want, they want, they want a full 25 years out of you. But the training program get, is phenomenal. I'm, I'm getting this picture of you as an air traffic controller and... I, I I don't know. I'm I'm getting a little scared. What are you, what are you saying? I'm a little on the controlling <laughs> side. I mean, <laughs> most everything would go over my head. Yeah, right, <laughs> right. So the one last thing, and, and we'll we'll end this this segment on it is, uh, you know, is there one of the things that we learned at, at my airline was that we had some instances that involved uh, terrain. Uh, one of them, uh, you know, was an unfortunate tragedy in in Colombia. Yeah. Um, but we. We all of a sudden realized, hey, are we doing stuff that's not that that, that shouldn't happen? And we discovered, yeah, yeah, let's go back and revisit this. So, what we one of the big things that we discovered was complacency. It is, yeah. You know, we were not giving ourselves the situational awareness to to uh, to understand where terrain was, and we caught that before there were any other other instances. Well, you and you helped the industry discover that as well. Right. Well, yeah. we, we had a, a product that was developed called a, a ground proximity warning system that used digital data to warn you of, of terrain. And, and it, it gets pretty detailed more than what we had before. So yeah, the, the, it's, it's good to catch a trend, but the, the more than anything, what I was bringing it up for was, you know, are we, because we have been so robust in our safety uh, programs and and been uh, proactive in it. Are we getting complacent because these things have And I think these are questions that have to be answered at this at this FAA. Yeah, I agree. Safety. And, and there might be a little bit, but uh, you know, 
being, you know, seeing what staying fairly close to the training department in my new role as a Czech airman, I'm seeing these guys come out and I'm watching the training that I did for that. And then my last recurrent, my last couple of recurrents and they're, they're focusing on staying on, on not falling into a complacent mode. Right. You know, so again, right. that's being addressed in the training and I'm sure that's happening in other airlines as well. Right. Yeah. But it can be, I mean, you get complacent driving down the road. Yeah. And look what happens. Yeah. You can't really afford complacency in aircraft. And I think the, the, uh, the industry is addressing that, yeah. you know, and again, with getting ahead of these, these incidents before they became an accident is uh, is smart play. All right. So again, to the traveling public, still the safest way to, to move about. Yeah. I mean, I'd, it really is. I'd rather get on an airplane than I-95. So we have go. to get on I-95 I today, know. just so you I know. know. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for reminding me. Yeah. Okay. All right, everybody, welcome to the cruise segment of our episode. Uh, on today's uh, cruise segment, we're going to talk about cruise schedule. What, 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 is, their, what is their function? Um, and basically, we can say their function is to keep the integrity of the schedule, the airline schedule. It's very important. Right. Um, and uh, the, they're there to make sure that all the crew members, uh, pilots and flight attendants, show up for their given trip on time. Everybody has to check in. Most airlines do electronic check-in. Um, but that is a big responsibility. The other one is they have to call if somebody calls in sick. So if you call in sick, you're going to call in sick to crew schedule, and uh, they need to call a reserve they pilot. they got to replace you. Yeah, yeah. they got to replace you with a reserve pilot or somebody that, that volunteers to, for extra time, extra money, essentially. That uh, was the key word. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, hey, listen, you know, hey. it's about... It's about uh, the almighty dollar Absolutely. sometimes, you know. So yeah. um, one of the things about uh, cruise schedulers is they are very adept at understanding the contract sometimes better than we do as pilots. And, Which is, and there's a lot of details. There is. Duty time. Yep. Right. Yeah. Uh, the amount of flight, flight time. time. Um, um, rest between. Rest between. Between trips and flights. Um, there's, yeah, it's, it's not easy. There is a lot not. to it. Um, but yeah. you're right. You know, their, their role is as important as, I mean, they're one of the more important roles in the airline because right. without them, um, nobody knows where to go and how to get there. Now, typically we bid our schedules. We know our schedules a month in advance and we show up and off we go. Hopefully we never have to talk to crew scheduling. Um, but weather, um, sick delays, mechanical delays that can cause legality issues. So now crew, crew scheduling has to get involved to fix all that, to make sure the airline can continue to run as close to on time as possible and keep pilots in the right place. Let me ask you this. Um, did you, we, we had two, two separate um, departments. One was crew schedule mm -hmm. and the other one was crew tracking. So once you signed in for your trip, you were done with crew schedule. Um, crew tracking is the one that would be responsible for trying to keep the integrity of that schedule once you were on the trip and, and, and they were involved with uh, potential uh, trip interruptions, uh, hotels, right. unscheduled hotels, things of that nature. We have crew planning, which leads you up to your schedule. And once you start that trip, it's all on crew scheduling, which handles all of these roles, you know, hotel issues, um, transportation issues on the ground. If you're going from one airport to another, or if the hotel that you're going to stay at doesn't have transportation, uh, you know, delays, sick calls, things like that, you would, it's always crew scheduling. Now there are different departments within crew scheduling, transportation, today's flight, regular schedule stuff. Um, then the flight attendants have the same thing. Right. But so you have a different name for it. We had tracking, you had planning. Right. So it, it sounds like they were similar. They similar are. I'm roles. sure they are. Okay. And, the, and, they're, and they're very difficult roles and there's a lot of them. Yeah. Yeah. We've, we, I mean, we only operate about a thousand flights a day um, with an average of six people on each airplane, six crew schedule, six crew members on each airplane. Right. So, I mean, you're, you're dealing with 6,000 plus people every day. Right. Yeah. You know, so there's a couple hundred crew, crew schedulers, again, in different roles. Multiply that with my airline and, um, you know, 15,000 pilots, Pilot. pilots, just pilots. Yeah. So flight attendants were uh, yeah, above got, 30. Yeah. You know, they were, so it, it was, it was, it's a lot of work. It is. And it's not easy and they don't have an easy job. And sometimes pilots and flight attendants just 
don't give them, don't make their life easy. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and I think that's just wrong. I've got a good, you talked about a quote, love, hate relationship. I think they do a great job with what they've got to work with in, in helping us get to where we need to be. Um, I always treated them with, with respect and dignity. And I think that anybody, everybody wants to be treated that way, but you know, it's, they always called me up and said, you know, captain, you know, here's what's going on. If we got a change in schedule and they were always very businesslike and, and, and respectful. Right. And, and sure. When you get called a lot by the same person, you develop a relationship. I've and, got some, some great friends that yeah. in, 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 uh, in schedule. And then and, you have days that, you know, it's like you, you know, it just, it's not working out the way you want it to work out. Right. And you, you, you know, you, 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 sometimes you butt heads, but I would say for the most part, I think they're not 90, 90 plus percent of the time. It's just a yeah. like, nice, easy conversation. Yeah. And, you know, and a lot of times, you know, I think the biggest issue you might have is is um, both of you understanding the same same section of the contract that you're referring to for this particular incident, you know, right. in, in incident that they're trying to resolve. And that's just simply making the airline continue to run. And you want to do your part because chances are you're someplace you don't want to be and you want to get home just like the passengers want to get home. So it's a it's kind of a group effort. Sometimes you just have to say, yes, dear. And, yeah. And, and then ask questions later. Right. You know, right. just yeah. move it along. Yeah. No, agreed. Okay. Once again, as we're in between our segments, we'd like to uh, ask you to uh, invite your friends to watch Candid Cockpit. Send an email with a question or suggest a topic to podcast at candidcockpit.com, and uh, we'll mention your error on name. Don't forget to watch us on YouTube, and then there's the social media sites, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. That's that's that's, that's it. it. MySpace is no I, longer. No, I can't. I can't handle any more <laughs> social network so channels. We, uh, so and, and, the, and the input that we're getting from uh, from our viewers and listeners is is great. It's bringing up a lot of topics. So keep doing it. Bring it on, please. Everybody, welcome to the final segment, our landing segment. We're going to talk about ATC communications, air traffic control communications, um, initially on, on the ground from the time just prior to engine start to the time that we get clearance to take off and then we get handed off to uh, into radar environment. So uh, the first clearance we, we really get, and sometimes we don't even have to talk about it because it's, it's done via a, a computer database through the FAA and our onboard computers, but... We get our clearance from our flight plan. It clearance is what we get, what we're what we're told to do, and where we're told to go. Exactly, and it tells us our routing and and, and all of that. And sometimes it gives us our delay time, and some uh, and then uh, we can acknowledge it verbally. Southwest twenty thirty one, like to pick up clearance to Nashville with Sierra. Southwest twenty thirty one, clearance cleared to Nashville at Southwest Tower, heading Comrade three thousand six, Southwest two eight zero one zero, set for departure. Departure frequency one two five point one two five zero seven six zero. Southwest 2031, clear to Nashville, Asphalt, runway heading on departure, 3,000, 280, and 10, 125.1, 0760, But a lot of times you can just acknowledge it via the onboard computer. Right. And and when you call for taxi, then you tell them that you, you one particular message indicates that you've got your clearance. The next part is uh, sometimes you get have to have like a startup clearance, uh, London would, would give you a startup clearance when they had a lot of uh, uh, airplanes that right. were calling for, for potential taxis. Uh, it doesn't happen too often in the States. I'm trying to think of someplace where it does. Boston would be the closest with, you call clearance delivery, even after you've got your clearance from them, to tell them you're ready to taxi, and then they tell you to monitor ground, and ground will then call you. And it could be in 30 seconds, could be in five minutes. Right. But and, yeah. And, and it becomes your discretion on when to start it and, and, you know, when to be efficient with it. But there's that. So startup, not so much. Um, usually your ramp control has control over that because that's not the area that air traffic control controls. And then, of course, there's a taxi clearance. So mm -hmm. you cannot go from your uh, airline ramp area is what we call it to the taxiways until you talk to an air traffic controller and they give you instructions. And as we know, it can be complicated. Good day. United 1585, all ground, taxi to runway 28 right from Mike Mike. 
Why don't you taxi northbound on Alpha Hotel, uniform over the Alpha Bridge, and I'll have more for you around taxiway Fox AC 3938 or ground, taxi to runway 28 right from Mike Mike. Hotel, uniform over the Alpha Bridge, more for you around Fox Drive. United 626 or ground, taxi to runway 22 left. Yeah, hotel uniform over the Alpha Bridge. We talked about that episode in uh, in JFK. Right. Um, but uh, sometimes some airports are simpler than others, and others are more complicated. So that taxi clearance is, is very important. And then after the taxi uh, clearance, once you get in line for takeoff, then you're given a takeoff clearance. Right. And it's pretty right. pretty simple. Yep. We have nine Charlie Golf and three seven left. Takeoff starts with two six thirty twenty one max thirty. Clear takeoff two seven left speed with nine Charlie Golf. And then after your takeoff clearance and your airborne, then the controller hands you off to what we call departure control, which is a radar environment mm-hmm. that you're involved. And with. they're going to bring you up higher into the sky and get you to an air route traffic control center, which then keeps you where you're supposed to go and how you're supposed to do it in route yes. to your destination, which then it kind of reverses. You're going to talk to an approach control facility, which will get you to the airport. The tower controller, which will get you onto the runway, and then the ground controller, which gets back to your ramp. Is there any details that you want to add, uh, you know, other than the outline I kind of gave as far as, you know, uh, the clearance uh, for your flight plan um, for, and then taxi? And- you know, those are, those are, those are, that's pretty much it. But I guess what I will, you know, a lot of times you'll hear from the, from the cockpit, you know, hey, folks, we've got a, a wheels up time or there's a flow program going into a certain airport and they'll have us sit on the ramp or on the runway or excuse me, on the taxiway or put us in in a spot where we have to just sit and wait it out. And it can be five minutes. It can be an hour. Um, and I think that's what uh, I think folks really kind of wonder, like, OK, they, they're blaming this delay on air traffic control. Well, it is. It's it's like. The 405 in Los Angeles on a Friday afternoon, and you've got those on-ramp traffic lights. <laughs> right. That's what the flow program is all about. It basically creates, for the highway, on-ramp traffic lights. I, I think you, you, you bring up a good point because uh, that flow control that you talk about, you know, with uh, getting on, uh, you know, the on-ramp, uh, can be in the form of thunderstorms and a line of thunderstorms all the way down you're looking at blue skies at your departure and your destination airport. is blue right. skies as but, well but air traffic control is funneling everybody around or through a particular hole in this particular line right and that is 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 basically why you're sitting on the ground but more so um is there anything uh, that you want to touch on as far as details of what the controller is saying to you or, you know, it goes back a little bit to our, to the, our training center. We talked about training and air, communication being one of the more difficult parts about learning to fly. And it is, you have to listen closely. You have to repeat it back almost verbatim, be as efficient as you can. Um, in our situation in the cockpit, a lot of times the first officer is the guy talking to, to air traffic control on the ground. Taxi, taxi clearances are usually the longest clearance you'll receive. Um, and short and, of, short of your, 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 your Pre-delivery clearance, your actual um, flight clearance, right? And it, and and you bring up something called phraseology. So yeah. it's very important to talk the same language. We don't, we don't, uh, we don't do CB talk. You know, no. it's 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 very I, specific. I've I've actually heard that on the radio. Yeah, it kind of makes me cringe. Yeah, when, a little when bit. I hear that. Sometimes. But yeah, it is, and more this so is the, in general aviation. You know, because right. because we have what we call the weekend warriors that go up and fly the, their the airplanes. But you know, and you and I fly our 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 airplanes. Yeah, uh, as professionally, you <laughs> know, on the Mike, weekends. Mike's pointing at, uh, at the model of my uh, my Piper Arrow. So yes. again, it's you 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 repeat everything back verbatim. Right. Um, use the correct phraseology because the controller should be so. Therefore, you should be as well. And it creates it 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 dissipates the potential for confusion in that clearance. Right. Which takes us back to some of these incidents. That we've discussed in the takeoff yeah. segment. Well, well, communication is a big part of it, it's huge. every part of our life. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and it, can't be any, it can't be any more, any, anything more important than in air traffic control because Absolutely. it's their job. It truly is the air traffic controller's job to keep airplanes apart. It is. So, yeah. Anything else? No, I think, um, you, nope. No, we we do what, we, <laughs> we do what we're told and where we're told to go. We do. And if we do that, um, smartly diligently and if you've got a question let's say you'll see you, you kind of have a question about air traffic controls uh um direction query him 
Just ask the question. Yeah. And they may go, oh, you know, hey, good catch or something like that. But Please clarify. Yeah. And, and and also, I'll add one thing, too. Every every air traffic control we're talking to, there's someone sitting next to them listening as well. Right. Every single position. So there's kind of like there's always at least two of us in the cockpit of the airplane. There's always two air traffic controllers that you're talking to. You don't know that the second one's there unless he overrides the first guy. But uh, there's always, too, again, redundancy, just part of the safety that the aviation industry uh, carries with it. Very good. Very good. Okay. Well, Captain Mike, it looks like we've uh, landed this episode uh, despite the joke that we had off air um, <laughs> that uh, we won't tell our audience about. It had something to do with fish. Sorry. Um <laughs> Uh, airplane is parked at the gate. I see the jet bridge moving up, and uh, we're glad everybody joined us. Yeah. Um, please, like we always say, um, send us an email at podcast at candidcockpit.com. Let us know if there's a topic you'd like discussed, and then um, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll certainly uh, put your name on air if you give us permission and yeah. so on and so forth. Um, next week, next week, we're going to discuss what it's like to be on call. What 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 is reserve status? Right. In other words, is what is what we call for now. Yeah, and yeah, there's a lot to discuss there. Yeah, it's, it can be interesting. Why is that pilot always home? Right. The neighbors ask sometimes. Well, yeah. does, does neighbor go to work? He's the insurance for the yeah. airline. Exactly. So you know, or she. So there we go. We'll discuss that next week. And while we begin our parking checklist, we just once again want to ask people to send us an email. Tell their friends, uh, podcast at candidcockpit.com. Next time you're on an airplane, poke your head on the cockpit and say, hey, you know, guys, I listen to Candid Cockpit and uh, kind of know what's going on here. Yeah, if you poke your head in, please please ask the permission of the flight attendant. Yeah, that's we true. Don't wanna, yeah. We don't want to promote anybody. people just bolting yeah. up there, and sometimes the crew can be busy, so <laughs> yeah. give it a moment. But right. uh, they, they would love to hear. That you're no, they do, candy. yeah. And I've talked to you know, a, lot of, a lot of the pilots I fly with now are kind of making comments, hey, we've heard about you guys and... It's kind of cool. So thanks for telling the world what it is more about what we do up front here. Uh, you can also catch us on uh, FaceTime, YouTube, Instagram, Twitter, social media. Pick one. We're there. Um, or Facebook. Face, Facebook. I fit say, FaceTime. Yeah, though. Fa- yeah, yeah face. you got enough of this FaceTime. <laughs> yeah. You don't need any more FaceTime. <laughs> hey, uh, thanks for joining us again. And uh, remember, don't get on an airplane unless you've listened to uh, Candid Cockpit. Thanks for coming. Thanks for joining us.